let's go. Let's start it. Well, we've got Alex's um, PRS style stag here, um, which is a much loved guitar, me reckons. Um, I like it when people are attached to a particular guitar that isn't, you know, majorly over fussy, over pretentious, or over expensive. So this is a, you know, what people would consider to be a very much a budget guitar. Um, but you can see that it's a nice PRS style shape. It's kind of got the credentials, electrics cavity on the back, tremolo cavity, and uh, a hand uh, buffed, uh, sanded back of the neck to make it a bit less sticky. And this is um, this is in for a an unusual one in that it's come in for a stainless steel refret. Now, you would look at this, and I will get criticism, and people will say, look at that, that is a perfectly good set of frets, wouldn't you say? Yep, absolutely. But you know what? When somebody wants what somebody wants, obviously those um, P-rails <coughs> with triple shot pickup ring things, and uh, there's a uh, series parallel switch there and a phase switch there. Uh, but when somebody wants what they want, well, heck, you get them what they want, right? <laughs> so, so I'm up here today uh, of an afternoon. It's a th Thursday, <laughs> and Met Office has slightly tricked me again because it tells me that the that what we've got is sort of below 70s into the 60s um, humidity here, but actually it's running just over 70 at the moment. So I've started doing some spraying in the other room because I have to get some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I have to get some polyurethane spraying done. Um, and it's a bit more forgiving than uh, nitro. But nonetheless, I have to get it done because I have to get it done. And tomorrow, when it must go down below 70, I have to get the uh, nitro done. So straight away, I'm just going to get the strings off this. Uh, they're nines. Um, and I'm going to get this de-strung and de-fretted and de-nutted as quickly as possible. And if I sound like I'm operating in some sort of hurry here, it's only because uh, Alex and his son dropped by this morning. Um, they're down in this part of the world till realistically Saturday evening. Um, Alex's son has got a couple of gigs down here, which is amazing. Um, so. I've got a window of getting this done, and it's something you know we organised quite a while back. So there's this window to get it. Ay, 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 blood. The little stabbing bits off the strings. And, oh, you bad boy. <laughs> yes, guess what I've found? The evils. <laughs> the evil locking business. Anyway, um, yeah, so I've got a, a, a kind of fixed time limit. So I've got to get cracking on this, and my plan, I've got quite a few things to do today, including fighting with these hideously locked off things. Oh, you naughty, naughty person. Um, hmm. Say no more. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I've got, I've got this to do. I want to get this refretted today, and I want it. Um, ready for tomorrow to do the setup part of it. Uh, ready to go tomorrow. So, um, I'll see how easy it is to get this strings out here. Uh, yeah, so get the refret done today and the setup done tomorrow. And that's be hopefully the target will be finished by Friday night so that sometime on Saturday Alex can swing around um, in between, possibly in between his son's two gigs and pick it up. Anyway, the challenge of this slightly is that um, because it's a short turnaround, um, it sort of changes a little bit how I think of approaching it. So my initial instinct would be to, depending on how well the new frets match the old, my initial instinct would be to um, aim for wood glue if glue is needed, or if there's any glue at all, aim for wood glue. However, 
we've got a couple of things kind of working here. One is that we've got a time limit, and that needs that means I've got to get this um, done, which means I can't really afford. Well, I don't want to leave it overnight before I do the uh, end beveling, that sort of thing. So that would be more likely what I'd do with a wood glue based refret. Um, so I need to get it done and dusted in the same day, the, the fretting part. That means that, in this case, to guarantee being on time with that, uh, a super glue refret would be easier, or would guarantee it a little bit more. Um, that needs a bit of clean up there, but otherwise not too bad. Um, so, and the other thing is, there's a little bit of, obviously, this is going to be hand tapped in because I don't have, uh, I can't really get access beyond about here, somewhere like that with the press. So it's going to be block tapped. Um, and so that means in turn, um, what does it mean in turn? Well, it means I have to get some, these, these, I have to hand bevel these up to about here and prepare these. Um, the other thing is looking at the finish on here, it's quite, quite a nice, well, a little bit of chipping on the edges. So I can either have a choice here. Either I attempt to retain the end fills and fret into them as if it were a, what's that word I'm looking for? Bound guitar, which can be quite a tidy way of doing it. It depends really how this all sort of works. So my first kind of feeling is, let's first of all, before we do any expensive investment in things like um, fretting, Let's make sure this neck works. Uh, not with that, it don't. Um, and what a good way of checking that it works is to let's do it up quite tight and let's see if we can back bow it a fair bit. Um, hmm. Let's see if we can. It's not really, not really playing the game very much in back bow, but it would be good anyway if we could because that gives us a a bit of, theoretically, a little bit of letting go of the frets. Yeah, there is a bit of back bow, but it's, I have to say, this is not playing the game massively, <laughs> willingly. But yeah, a little bit of back bow would be good because we can, um, like I say, we can bend the, uh, it, if you back bow, it sort of releases its grip on the frets a tiny bit easier. That's the theory. So that's what I'm doing there. Whatever they're doing here in the recycling place, it sounds like they're playing a giant game of tennis some of the time. Okay, so here I'm going to just see what the, um, the feel of the fret lifting is. It's actually not bad at all. So I'm just piling straight in with getting a few of these frets moving and a sort of twist and lift feel um, just to get, the, get them moving. And then I'll get the, that was a bit, tearing feel. Um, then I'll get the more traditional fret puller out and we'll get this first set out. Um, so we're just piling straight into it and then once I've got these out and I've decided whether I'm keeping the end fills or not. The benefit of keeping the end fills is simple that you can sort of fret into there and you don't have to really worry about going over with poly, a bit of extra um, poly to finish it because the problem in a sense with this is that if I put some poly on you know if it if it tears if there are chips of poly out the end here or you want to fill them with poly um, then it's it's going to take uh, may take you know short uh, may take longer than we've got to build up a couple of layers I'm not sure it would actually I think we'd probably get away with it in the time but you know I don't like to be on a rush and, and it actually doesn't take that much to fill because if we the, the, if I go the other way around, the, the benefits of um, not having, not leaving the end fills in means that we can run the, the fret saw, slot saw, all the way through. And in doing so, we can ensure that the fret slot is clean. A, bit, a little bit of flaking there, very dry. Um, we can ensure that the slot is clean all the way through. Um, and we won't get any obstructions when we come to refret. So that's a plus of sawing all the way through. Um, the downside is, is it leaves you with uh, end, end 
gaps if you cut the frets short. If you go, let the tango right to the edge, tango to the edge, um, then you you can sand the metal right flush with everything else, but you also still tend to just about take some of the finish off the edge because it has to, to, to get flush, it has to eventually run up against the finish, otherwise you won't be flush. Um, so that's the downside of um, fretting to the end and using the fret beveling block. But really, you can't get away without using that block um, if you want a sharply finished inline set of frets. Now, this looking at this, this is this is a little bit flaky, and I'm hoping that our wire is going to comfortably cover that up. And we've got the uh, we've got the 4300 wire. Um, yeah, it is a little bit on the flaky side, I'm afraid. But what we'll do is we'll we'll th there are options on this. You either you can't stop all these little tiny flakes coming out, and you certainly can't replace them because you end up with a, a kind of crusty pile of glue that realistically it causes far more problems than it solves so the uh, sort of way around it is to assess you have to really assess are any of these of any significant size and if they're not then it's better in my experience to fret on top of the uh, on top of them and to really fill if you have to fill by exception in other words look for any visibly horrible ones and go after those with a little bit of rosewood and whatever you've got. This isn't rosewood, this is probably how ferro. Um, we go after it with a bit of dust and glue. Now that is where we revert back to the lifting game. This, I'm very pleased to have been doing, started doing it this way. When you get to this end, by the way, you can't get the blade in between the uh, fret, so you have to pretty much do them one at a time. But previously, all the other ways of doing it, I tried these pliers almost always crush the end, whichever end you start with, they almost always crush some part of the fingerboard as you get the first bite going. Because it's um, particularly if the, the better the frets are fitted originally, the more it's likely to crush. Because by definition, it's the tang, uh, the crown is very flush to the wood and it doesn't really want you to get a blade or a pair of blades like this underneath it so you sort of find yourself pushing down with the, these little pointy bits right on the end of the frets and in doing so you you do sort of end up with a bit of compression you don't really want um, oops, two at once you shouldn't do that um, so having decided to use the blade um, which is a much thinner edge obviously and I can get it under and then with a combination of sort of twisting and lifting I can spread the, the flat blade itself spreads any pressure around further so I can I can lift the end with far less um, damage to the, the uh, fingerboard so whoop, sometimes it does that it cracks the blade edge but more often than not it doesn't cut me because normally I'm going to do it like that Normally, I've got a firmer grip like that. So, you know, it, you have to watch out. Obviously, working with a blade is not the easiest. I never understood why these aren't sprung. Why I have to open them and close them with one finger inside the thing. That seems ridiculous to me. Now, when I started doing guitars, uh, doing a stainless steel refret, was considered, when I started to research, was considered a, a sort of mysterious and, I don't know what the word would be exactly, uh, scary, a very much feared undertaking. Um, and you'd see people shaking their heads and going, <sighs> all that sort of noise. You know, experienced luthiers would sort of quake at the mention of it and so on. So as a newcomer to it, you, you don't really quite know What's, what's it all about? And then, of course, you, you sort of you try and find answers and you get folklore, mostly. Um, 
and, and legend and stuff. So, um, as with all these things, it just turns out ultimately the only way you ever work out what the hell is different with stainless steel to anything else is to get in there and do it, um, which eventually I I just decided to do. And in a certain kind of way, my first stainless steel refret was completely underwhelming in that I expected you know, some sort of ogre battle or Clash of the Titans or something. Queen reference, um, Har Ray Harryhausen reference. Um, yeah, yeah and, and actually, I think I, I sort of did it. And the first impression was the only way I knew it was a... Right, the only way I could tell that I was doing a stainless steel refret was one thing that people had said is that it's much harder to cut. And... Fair enough, that's exactly what I found. So my trusty fret cutters, I really had to sort of swing on them to get it to cut. And I, a lot of the time I was genuinely afraid <laughs> that um, I was actually going to break them before I got anywhere close to cutting the fret. Uh, that wasn't the case though, I got the frets cut, but it, it really was a different order of strength required to cut them and, and to do it and you probably see on this one I had to um, I absolutely had to uh, cut them with a cloth over them so that basically um, it didn't fire the fret around the uh, around the room now just for a second what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by putting some protective tape right down on these bits here because I know that I've got to get in here um, and if not with the block, which I, I will aim not to, I'll aim to f cut these and bevel these to size, I still will need to get in there with the fret um, end finishing file. Um, and so anything that kind of can tip over and damage the finish, I want to get safely wrapped up. And what I tend to do is I tend to put some green frog tape down first, and on top of that I will put some doubly strong uh, gorilla tape and that gives me a margin of overrun with the the fret end files particularly because when you when you're using those they, they sort of point downwards usually as you're using them so that gives me a, a clear overrun um, and then I can mask off the, these things whatever they're called the bits that make the noise um, they're just sort of courtesy dust covers in this case um, but it's this area here that I'm protecting from accidental dam damage. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to take the... I'm going to find the digital caliper and I'm going to measure the tang on these and check it against my new incoming tang. So here it's 0 0.67, 0 0.6. Just double check it. It's actually quite thick. Uh, oh, actually, hang on, 6.2, 6.2.5.3, you can never tell. Let's get a cleaner one. 7.1, hmm. So it's kind of going anywhere from 5.5.2. Five, 5 to 0 0.7, so if we call 6 in the middle... Um, so what we'll do is we'll just unhook this replacement wire and we'll just double check that. Now I get two meters per guitar, which is enough per guitar. Actually, it, it's, it's more than enough. It gives you a bit of leeway for messing a few up, which is quite handy, um, especially when you, if you are like me and you're, you discover that your fret cutters actually, if you're not careful, the way they operate they can leave a little mark on the fret and you'd have either have to uh, level that out and clean it up later or if you just think well hang on I've got enough material here I'm not going to mess around let's just get it right from the off um, you can do it that way so here's my piece of wire first of all I don't know how well any of you can see that Ta -da. here's my hoop of wire you can see it's two meters in a big coil and what I tend to do is join it up find the halfway mark and then I get my famous f f cutters and I will go. Now, you'll notice straight away that these 
didn't want to cut it. That's the bad side of my um, fret cutters, uh, which is already a bit damaged. So that's probably why I didn't cut it, but it's not going to be easy for the rest. So there's my two bits equal length, which is what I wanted to do, get two pieces equal length. Now, we agreed that this thing, it's a bit old, so it's a bit worn as well. Um, I'm going to put the thing back to level in a minute. But we agreed that it was a bit flatter than a 9.5. But I don't think it's a, maybe, it could be more, more like a 12 than anything else. Um, I know that Alex did a measure at his, at his end. It's a bit rounder than a 12. Um, it's, it's got a bit of flattening in places because of the wear, really. Uh, that is a bit too round. That's a bit too round. Meh. I think, I think it's really, it's certainly not 7.25. I think the closest that it's got is 9.5. Um, um, now, the thing about that is it isn't perfectly even, but it's not compound radius. So it's the sort of, it's the sum of mm, organic changes over the years. So we're working with something that isn't precise. So if you were doing your first refret, you might start panicking at this point, thinking, well, how the hell can I do it? I, I you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a sort of infinitely, weirdly compound radius that I can't control. And that's okay, because... What we think, if you, if you keep in mind, what we're going to do is we're going to tap the frets to this, um, and they will, they will want to sit on there. If we say it's 9.5 and it is very fractionally out from 9.5, these will sit at 9.5, and if the underlying fret is tiny bit out from 9.5, it won't mind. It will just. It'll just um, sit at 9.5. If we if we tap it in with a 9.5 call or a 9.5 shape uh, piece of wood, or even if we tapped it in with a little thinner block, and it will kind of sit at at the it will mostly sit at the radius that I cut it at. So um, I think the thing to do next, just to put the camera down there, is um, well, no, not the thing to do next. What we've got to decide is what the radius, no, what the tang width is on here. Um, this wire appears to be a little bit narrower generally, so we might find that the tang is in itself a tiny bit narrower, but we might not. Yeah, 50, 55. No, it's probably about the same, as near as makes no difference. So the question is, um, I think we should, we should uh, go all the way through and have the metal come out the other side rather than do an end fill. Uh, oh no, actually it doesn't really matter, does it? If we do, right, here's the, here's the thing. If we do, um, if we do treat it as a, a bind binding, a bound neck, right? What we have to do is we have to get in here like this to clean it, <laughs> okay? And we can do a fairly good job of that. As you can see, I can get the, a blade in there <laughs> right to the end and it, it's preserved the end pieces. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a piece of wire first. Now let me just check because one of the things you get with these big pieces of one meter pieces of steel is one end or the other, or sorry both ends usually, or one end usually has a flat spot and I think it's there. So I'm going to cut me a sample fret to go to include that bit because I don't really want that bit of thing. So. Okay, it's not jumbo, so it's cut a little bit easier than others I have done. So here's my stainless thing. Now, the problem with that, I've got to get me, me uh, nippers and so on and so forth. And I'll show you what I'll do. This, so this is what we'll do if we're cutting like a overhang thing. Now, cutting like a binding, right? Remind me I'm zoomed in. So I've got enough spare to do this little test, right? So the first thing I do is I get my tang nippers and I will attempt <coughs> to cut the overhang and I'll cut this flush. So we've got a little bit of overhang, a little bit of not overhang. Then we'll kind of line it up like that. Seem to be seating quite well. And then we'll, we'll go to the other end, cut it to length first. You'll see my grimacing as I'm chopping this with these pliers. If these die on this good job, it's going to get 
uh, quite a bit more difficult cutting it with uh, some other devices, Dremel or something. Okay, so now I've got me a fret that should just sit in there nicely. And what I'm getting a feel of is it does, that sits in there very easily. So I would probably be a little keen to get some glue in there. The alternative is we do a little bit of twisting of the tang to widen it just slightly. Um, but anyway, so that's the idea. If we put it in like that, um, it would sit in there like that. And then we, we uh, come along here and we end bevel but we leave in the finished bit. And the only, like I say, the only downside is I can't predict or can't be absolutely certain that I have got all of the grime out of the slot. And you can see if I keep on sort of dragging this along, it'll keep on bringing out detritus, depends on which end of the thing I use. So it, it's not impossible. If you keep, if you go a bit too hard, you'll end up kind of grinding through the end piece anyway, which sort of defeats the object. Um, so you can see it's a delicate business of cleaning out. The overhang here should give me a little bit of leeway. So if there's some crud built up in the corner, that overhang should allow it to just um, clear it. Now, I'm just kind of getting a look at this. I have a feeling this is, I'm saying it's loose. It, it sits in quite loosely, but actually it's just above and it will take a bit of tapping in. So I think, hmm, what do we think? I want to be able to work it. The, the downside is if we do it with super glue, we have to be very quick. And our fretting process basically has to tap this in with no messing about. Now, if there's a bit of spillover, we can clean it up afterwards. What I will do to begin with on this neck is I will get some sandpaper on here because um, what we do need is a smooth surface to fret onto. There's my stainless steel fret. Yeah, we need a, a smooth surface, and if we don't prepare this surface a little bit... Now, obviously, what I don't want to do is I do not want to... Um, I don't want to re-radius it into a different shape. If I was concerned about its shape, I could try and sort of tidy it up to a, a consistent nine and a half inch radius, but I don't think it needs that. What it needs more than anything is something to take away the... Uh, some of the grime, but also some of the sticking up stuff here. So I'm just using this um, 240 grit paper as a sort of cleanup more than anything else. It's not, it's not about um, reshaping anything. So it's just a freshen up. Um, and the reason for this is I want, I want these new fret crowns to sit smoothly on there or firmly on there without these little ridges. Uh, what it also does is it, it'll tell me pretty quickly what what's going on in, in the land of big chip outs. If there's anything major going on, this will either lift it out or press it back down. Um, so I'm, I'm being very careful to keep the ends of the paper lifted up so I don't drag it across any finish when I'm down here. Obviously, you'll now see that I've got to go back over it. Um, and I will need to dig out any grime in there. But having done it, you can see all the sort of sticking, that's finger grease sticking in the, uh, the grit or the bite of the paper. So now I'm just sort of going back over it with a bit of clean paper just to finally smooth off those slot edges, really but not staying anywhere long enough to affect the radius adversely. Okay, so that's that. So that's, a, that's become a, a smoother surface, which is what I want, without doing a complete re-radius. Um, but as mentioned now, I, I used to have tinned air and stuff. It just seemed, I don't know, environmentally unsound. So I've done away with that. So what I, I have to do is a sort of slower process of digging and blowing and... Sorry about that, right in the old thing. Okay, so that's nice and smooth. It's got rid of any sort of frazzled edges. And that's really how I could do it with an overhang. I think I might actually do that. That way we get to more or less keep all of the overhang. And the reason for doing keeping that would be in this 
quickish turnaround um, it, it's a benefit not to be waiting for some or take it home and have to uh, put some poly on then get it up thick enough to uh, let it dry have it thick enough to be able to sand it back without causing any other further problems and then be able to buff it out and so on and so on to blend it in this way we may still um, hit on the uh, edge finishing a little bit but it wasn't perfect in the first place so all that matters is as long as we can uh, fine sand it smooth I don't really mind if it's um, down in places to, even to the wood which it currently is because of the, the uh, s small amount of crack off not the place in Poland but uh, how the finishes come off so again it comes right down to the edge I'll um what I think I'll do is I'll do this off camera um actually no that's silly because I've I've got things to do now other things I've got to do which I might as well take you for a walk down here Oops, you aren't seeing anything. I've got a bit more spray to do, so why don't I take you take you for a spray walk? Um, this would probably end up being mighty noisy. Uh, oh, where are you? There you are. Something like that. Okay. Um, what do I really need to do? I probably for this short amount of thing, I probably don't need to do anything. It's only uh, it's only water based, so. Uh, stand by for noise. Another quick coat. Oh, we're down to 68. That's good for a change. We're down below the. Okay, another coating on here. I'm trying to get a little bit of colour into these first, so I'm using um, slightly tinted uh, poly, which is good. Um, and then on the SG one, the Gordon Smith, I will switch from. I will just uh, stop because it's a very thin finish anyway. I'll stop and I'll put some matte poly from a can and spray that on. Um, but with the CMI Tele neck, I will um, build up quite a bit more finish, a thicker finish uh, of clear poly, which I'll switch over in the gun because that's tinted and I'll put that back in its jar over there. Right. Uh, so actually, no, I'm not going to go anywhere. So it's too much kerfuffle. I'm just going to get on and clean these out with you here. And if uh, you'd like to go and make yourself a cup of tea, please feel free um, and ignore me. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking ahead to the glue thing, um, and that, you know, I'm not. I'm nervous about the super glue thing, and I've I've used super glue a million times before in fretting. And uh, the only downside of it is that it is quick to dry, obviously, and possibly more so now because of the temperatures that we got. It's warm now. Um, so my worry is that it doesn't, you know, set before I can get the fret seated. And with a press, uh, you tend to get a bit of a sort of one go straight down shot hold it and your fret is seated or it isn't and you can quickly assess it and if it isn't you pull the damn thing up with the with this method which is going to be a tapping ha hammering tapping it in with the block um, I'm slightly concerned that I won't get a, a clean firm hit all in one go and it'll take a few taps and I what I absolutely don't want is for it to get sort of glue to go off while the fret is sort of halfway down and then refuse to go any further. I 
don't ever recall it having done that, but it makes me nervous. So I would be much more comfortable if actually what I'll do is I'll start, and I should, this should be my watch word, my benchmark. I'll start with tapping it and wood gluing it down on the bench there in a short while. Because actually the truth is I can probably afford a good few hours for it to set enough to um, you know, end, end bevel, edge bevel. Um, so I will, as I say, I will start with tapping the frets in, um, assuming that they'll fit pretty cleanly but not excessively tight, which is exactly what we want. Um, if they, if, if I get the sense straight away that they're too loose, Lutrec, then immediately I will stop and I will revert or change to a super glue strategy or consider the super glue strategy as a way of making sure they stay down where I want them. So we'll, we'll kind of do it that way as a, as a only if necessary because it imposes, as I said, other risks and concerns about um, or limitations on its use. So I'm kind of going down the fret the other way, just to be sure. When I get to this bottom end, I sort of tilt it up and lever out any goo. Um, but, you know, as mentioned, the, the, um, the little overhang cut gives me that bit of leeway so that if there is some detritus in the corner, we don't have to have cleared it exactly out. Um, the, the slight downside of having a, a little flying overhang, uh, which is what you, you're committed or you're, you're sort of enforced, you're obliged to do if you're, um, if you're refretting a bound neck anyway, you don't have a choice in it. But when you use an overhang, um, you, there is a very slight chance that the, the overhanging piece of crown sort of has a tendency to, or potentially lifts up doesn't want to seat down with the rest of it. Now, that again is where super glue can be really useful if you're fretting with super glue because um, in a press situation with super glue, uh, that, that overhanging crown will be sort of forced into place and held there. And then when all the glue goes off, it's a, it'll be much more likely to stay where you want it. Um, but, you know, if we're trying to avoid that sort of uh, super glue approach, Mainly because I think, in my experience, super glue is is effective. Uh, the cleanup is a lot harder. You have to scrape, um, end up realistically scraping, in between frets to clean up, um, and you you know that that has a sort of impact on how the thing looks, how the wood looks. But um, you know it, it it its other downside is that it it causes. Um, it grips the wood a lot harder, so somebody looking to refret it at a later date. Now, you might say, well, who's going to refret a stag 30 years from now with stainless steel frets? And you might be right, it might be a highly unlikely eventuality. But that aside, you know, it, it, still, it still feels bad to me that it's be, you know, it will have become a lot harder to do um, if we use super glue. It's a sort of principle. Okay, and it's. I think that I'm beginning to feel that it's the same with. Um, it's the same with um, fixing nuts in May. Okay, there's the original frets. Now comes some enjoyable fun. This is where I hope to goodness that my cutters survive the journey. <laughs> I'll just I'll zoom around here, and uh, we can see. So I'm just holding the fret wire and I'm going to cut over length and I'm going to do it in such a way that I hopefully avoid putting this crimp on the fret as I uh, on the fret as I cut it it has a sort of tendency to want to do that so I'm going a bit long and avoiding dinging yeah, it's trying to do it I can see it it's putting a little mark on there that's ridiculous so I have to actually cut it at a dopey angle which now doesn't quite want to cut it to avoid putting that little mark on it. 
Uh, it's because the the way the it's the way this thing shuts down comes to comes down on the other piece of wire it catches it in a certain sort of way which is most annoying anyway so I'm going to have to concentrate on ex exaggerating this angle and hope that it doesn't put too much it's not the end of the world these marks if there are any at all are very small and they can be you know we can get rid of them with the leveling process which we expect to do anyway that's the that's the thing sometimes I kind of think, oh, I've made it impossible now to get a, you know, I can't get a perfect fretting because I'm still going to have to level this to get rid of those little marks. Um, that's true, and sometimes one in 25 or so, you get a perfect fretting, and it's really great when it happens, but it is much rarer than it is common, <laughs> if you get what I mean. <sighs> um, so it would be nice, but it's unlikely. Um, I don't think... I've ever done a non-stop start to finish refret. I'm not sure exactly that this will be it without a gap because I've got some lunch that I want to have and I need to stop and take a breather somewhere along the way. But it would be quite cool to do it from start to finish. And then you see how long it takes even if you don't do anything else. Mind you, I've already ruined that by doing something else, which is the spraying. <coughs> So I'm hoping to get all of the poly spraying that needs spraying done today because with the with the warmth and stuff in the air I'm hoping this will dry fairly quickly and that I'll be able to kind of just build up enough coats for now to call it quits because then I can finish setting up both of those guitars uh, I guess it will be early next week at the latest I want to get them done and dusted. So because I'm having to make this extended bend on these frets, I'm, I'm sort of using up more than I would ideally like to. But I don't really have a lot of choice. But I do have, thankfully, enough leeway to do it. So I'm, I'm having to overcut a little bit. And I'll go back over in a minute now and trim everything down with a mixture of undercutting and trimming back the crown overhang. So <coughs> I've always said that the secret I found of getting a good uh, refret are several and it's preparation, preparation, preparation. You won't be surprised to hear. So getting the wood that you're going to put the frets onto cleaned and sanded of some way so if it's really misshapen and old and kind of corroded then you know you might you might um what's the word i'm looking for re-radius it uh, if it is um if it's just like this one a little tired and in need of a refresh and a removing these crests here um, I've gone and made a whole extra set. Look at that. I've got a spare one. Uh, you might, you might um, just do a, a small amount of um, leveling, not leveling, sanding, like I did there. So what I do, first of all, is I get this overcut, sorry, cut the underhand, un overhang, underhang on one side, um, seat it down with, I want a bit leaning out over there, and then I just seat it there for now. So I undercut, I trim back to about, two and a half, three millimeters, ah, with the correct side of the cutters. Um, and then I place it with the undercut tang comfortably in the slot and a little bit of material hanging out over the edge. And now I've just failed to cut it properly. And now I'll just do it with all of the frets down one side to begin with. And then I'll mark all the frets up and come back and do it the other side. And then we'll have the right length and I'll be ready basically to move everything over there. We'll reset the camera and we'll sit down and install the frets. Um, like I say, we don't have the, we don't really have the press available. Some Somebody might say, well, why don't you use the press for the first 20 or something? Or, no, not 20, first 
six, 17 or so. Um, and my instinct has always been I don't like to change the method because I find that the force required or the force used can change quite a bit. If I, at least if I tap it, uh, there's a likelihood I will do it with a similar uh, strength all the way up. And that's quite important to avoid um, ending up with low frets because it's it can be surprisingly easy with a even with a fret press to over press a fret and that way it sits a I don't know, tenth of a millimeter lower than everything around it and it really messes things up you wouldn't quite believe it but now this one I didn't cut the tang the overhang quite long enough so I've gone back and given it another bite and that was fine so at this point in the game, you're sort of moving swiftly along. So I badly cut that one, so I had to take two bites at it. Um, you're moving nicely and swiftly along, um, and it, you're starting to see the new frets laid out on the on the surface, and it kind of makes you think of refretting a guitar. Now I can see one or two very small um, chip outs here showing, um, and we have to just decide whether we're going to go to the lengths required to fill them. Uh, the reason I don't personally like doing them before the fretting is because when you do, the glue often gets sort of drip drained, drains into the slots, and then you've got an extra problem to clear the slots out. And I just find that we can do without that extra trouble. So I, is it, but it's a, it's a judgment call whether you you know, you're going to do the work before or after, or not at all if it's minimal, you know, and if you're prepared to accept that, you know, in, in re-fretting, it's, it's not a completely uh, victimless <laughs> undertaking. Now, I've just screwed up this one, but trying to take a bite here, and it's just not having it. So that's my bad use of the um, this tang nipper. And there's a certain way of doing it. Sometimes you just get it wrong, and you know when you've got it wrong, and you just you give up the ghost. Now, these are sitting in quite comfortably. I wouldn't say loosely, but comfortably. And we'll sort of know. Remember I said, I'll, we'll go over there, and I'll try. See, now, as soon as I've made one screw up, I now can't seem to cut the overhang on any of them. It's always the way. So um, I'm going to... Uh, when we go over there, I am going to, um, what am I going to do? Yeah, I'll do a test and we'll tap the first one in. And if, if there's any sort of sense of it being too loose in any way, then we may need to look at um, a small amount of tang twisting. <laughs> it sounds like a, an interesting sort of thing you do at a rodeo or something. But it sure is. Yeah, this weird this this nipper. I've used this now for must be seven, six or seven years, and it's been great. But honestly, you can get to a point where you know as soon as you're doing it, it's going to twist or or crunch off the side, and it won't work. And you know you've messed it up straight away. And most of the time, you just go, "Yep, nice and clean." But some of the time, you won't. Like that, not a very good thing. Now these are excessively long, so I think I can afford to trim this back a little bit. Yeah, I've got a ton of wire here. Thank you, that's better. Whew. Yeah, massive overhang. And that one didn't bite. You could probably even hear it. It sort of squelched it, and now it's half chewed it. snaps with a crack when, when it's right um, but when it's not going to do it it's sticky or soft if it, well, it's not really soft but it it has a sort of yeah spongy thing to it and then it, it sort of cuts into the that's wrong see I've absolutely screwed that up now that's now put a, a kink in the end of the fret so if this is now too short I may Borrow this one from here, try that one on there, and see, yeah, we've got room. So just a bit of rearrangement now. So, 
I probably now could say I've been thinking about it too much. That's usually the way. Maybe there. Now we've got an extra long one. Nice tang. There. Okay, I'm a genius. I can cut, tang, cut these tangs all day long. Nothing ever goes wrong for me. The demon tang cutter of Mandalay. It all depends where you place your tang for cutting. It's a very contemplative little activity, this. Slow and plodding. And like I say, all down to success is all down to preparation of the surface, of the frets, of the slots. Now, if you remember, by the way, I was not going to, I know I can't reach these frets here with the block from about here. So I'm going to, I'm going to probably do this top seven by hand. Now, the downside of doing it by hand is that if you stare at it down the neck, look at it long ways, you'll probably spot that they're slightly different lengths because doing it by hand, there is absolutely no way of making it look as ma machine sharp as by doing it with the, the beveling block, right? Um, so it's just the price you pay for avoiding damaging, because the beveled block will not fit up there without damaging the finish. So I'm not even going to try. So what I'll do is I'm going to I'm going to hold after this marker here. I'm going to do something else to these end frets. But first of all, I'm going to I'm going to now mark the ends of here and cut in from there. Not very dark pen, so I have to be good with my eyes. So I'll end up with as little as possible, really, to um, need beveling backwards. But as I say, the, the, the plus of the using the end beveling thing is that it gives you this precise edge that, that is basically governed by the edge of the fretboard. I mean, you can't get that if you do it by hand. No matter how hard you try, it just doesn't happen. And I have tried. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll have a separate fate for these end ones. And what it means is I'm just going to cut them to size and hand and hand end bevel them to a, get a guesstimate of 45 degrees or close-ish. Okay. So there's my there's my fret now sitting. I can go either side because there needs to be a little bit of overhang on either side, on both sides, to, to get the, the beveling block to work. I'll give it something to do. Um, so with a bit of overhang on either side, we can now drop it in. It sits, sits comfortably. And we're ready. We'll be ready to put them in. Again, same here. Drop it in, push it. That's what we'll end up with. End to aim to press it in with that little bit sticking up either way, either side. Um, and, and that's what we're aiming for is a sort of central. With the same amount hanging out either side is what I should be saying. Now, also before I commit to anything, what I also need to make sure is that. Once I've done this trimming, um, I'll go back over all of them. More time, more fiddling, but I want to make sure that the ah, get this right. I want to make sure that the um, the tang is in the right place and there it's not jammed up against anything, so that it will prevent it from seating properly. Because sometimes in doing this trimming, you can end up with not much overhang on one side and too much on the other, and then the tang is trapped in the corner, obstructing things. It's just a matter of keeping on going. And then with the ones at the top, I'm going to take them out and I'm going to hand bevel them on some sandpaper. Um, hand bevel them at an angle and trim them to, or tr yeah, trim them down to exact size at the same time. 
So it'll be a sanding process more than anything. So you can see it is a slow old thing. That's me. That's the slow old thing. It was great to see um, Alex and his uh, son come over today because, you know, they, they, they're people who know me from videos like this and people who know Claire from videos and people who know Morris from videos. So they got to meet Morris, um, who came made a, a garden appearance. Uh, and, and they got to see the shed. Not in the shed, but just the shed where Real Love Guitars began its plans for world dominations. Now, it's, you know, the thing about that is, I know that for, I'm going to say this in inverted commas, but for famous people who use social media or TV or whatever to become famous, well-known. Um, I guess the, it, it's true that the um, the idea of fame is a curse in some ways, you know, that people recognize them and eventually after a while it becomes, it becomes something they don't like. You know, I'm sure the, the egos like it for a while and then when they get sort of fed up with it or had enough of it after a while, um, it becomes a real annoyance and they, they would like to get away from it. But I, I used to, when I used to do podcasting, I used to really enjoy commenting or, you know, c um, contacting other people's podcasts and, you know, they would do things like they would read out my comment or play my comment and then answer, you know, respond to it. And for a sort of digital medium that wasn't controlled by the man, you know, the, me the broadcast media or the powers that be. Uh, it was just a great connecting device. I really loved how that you could do that. And I like the fact that I, I knew back then from having done quite a bit of that, I knew that people sort of felt they knew you after they'd listened to your podcast for a, a while. Um, of course, you, you do to a certain degree. You know of people. And of course, they may never have met you and so you know them first and it's a head start um, and when I met people through podcasting um, it was it, I it really did feel like it speeded sped it up sped up you know cuts out a lot of kind of getting to know you stumbling around and if it's both ways then it's even better because you have some idea of each person but anyway um, so I knew that before I did this video stuff I knew that would be a factor um, and you know, I'm sh I'm sure you know it's not going to. But um, you know, if, if it was a type of thing that was about becoming famous, doing something that became so well known you get famous, um, right on the nose. Uh, I'm sure that you would, I would, not have quite the same thought and say, yeah, it's really great to meet somebody who knows Morris and Claire and. You know, is 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 interacting warmly with me, like they they kind of know me and have decided they you know get on with me or whatever. Um, it might not be quite as positive as that. It might feel a lot more intrusive or something. But who knows? Um, okay, so so that's the that's the first thing. Now, what I what I'm going to do is I'm going to just look at where the on each one of these I'm going to look where the tang sits, um, and it's make sure that it is substantially clear enough of the ends so that when it's in centrally I'm not I'm not under any risk in any risk there is no risk of um, clipping the corners now that one could be said to be a fraction uh, short oh, you damn thing. sometimes that just will not start the way you want it to. That one's okay, just about. That one's okay. That one's okay. That one's okay. Central. 
that one's hard to get out that one's okay so it needs i need about a millimeter and a half overhang in from each end to be sure that it's clearing you know it's clearing 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 anything um, and if i feel that it's sticking up at one end then it could be i need to just check the slot again for debris um, what we it's a balance between you don't want too much overhang because the last thing you want is these turned up fret ends that sort of fly um, it's definitely not what you want now I'm, I'm stopping at what the fourth from the end of the markers so if we look at the the tool of doom and we say to ourselves with within with realistically how far can we get down here I mean we could get technically we could get right down to you know three before the end I suppose um, I think three before the end is as much as we can do so what we do is we take these three out to begin with and we can get to the same let's do let's do four just to be on the safe side so these four I'm gonna have to hand trim and there's only one way to do it and it's it's using something like uh, a sanding block like this so I'll start with the very end one and what I'm going to do is I'm going to sand it roughly on 80 grit at an angle now this is stainless steel so it's uh, it's not going to be not going to comply too easily but it doesn't it isn't actually as bad as all that so I'm just cutting down to size and then polishing off a little bit if I can if I go off to one side I have to come back and kind of tidy it up I don't want it to look terrible so this is the far end one right far end so once I get to there I can't handle it at the moment I just can't handle it so what I'm aiming to do is put that back in and I want to run this smooth to the edge there and it and I get a sense of how much it overhangs at the other end right and so I will now come to the other end and do a similar so you can see this is not a quick business but it does work and it's the only way of protecting the end piece the end of the you know the finish and that sits in perfectly well I'm happy with that so so I'm just getting a, the bevel up on one side first assessing the amount of overhang at the other end and then making a combined bevel stroke trim at the other end to complete the operation side drop it in nice 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 now technically I could look at that and see I've got about that much we could cut off there because why why make it harder than it needs to be so if I can just pop this back in push it Go in, will you, damn it. Now, seat that in there. Right. Okay, get a sense of how much is required. Not much, really, just enough to get a, a bevel on it. So, it seems like a lot of hard work, but it, it does, it's the only way to buy myself out of having to get that thing up there and you can do the whole lot that way and I've done it in the past that way um, particularly where you've got uh, very flaky or, or vintage delicate finish on the edge of the guitar um, I think did I do it what did I do it for just recently I think I've already uh, yeah I've already done the ends of the what's going to be the Gordon Smith SG2 because 
that in a different way that's got a very nice finish on the neck and I don't want to damage it in any way by end beveling it to infinity um, so I'm, I've made a decision to shape those all by hand to begin with um, I may regret it someday now having done that see I now know that I need to just extend the overhang just slightly now I've resized that okay and then that up one because actually what I've done is I've made that one a fraction too short so I'm going to take it up to a place a little bit further up and I'm going to work that one and that one these two so I just did a bit of replacing there now if I, if I couldn't replace one I would simply cut another one because there's no point getting started with a, a little underhang that looks bad or, you know, a, a sort of wibble, a wiggle on the edge of the frets, the way they line up. Like I said, it's very difficult to get this precise because it's not machine finished. You know, it's not, it's not mechanically finished. You are kind of doing it by hand here. So, tricky, but... worth you know admitting if it's not working redo it and that's the other piece of advice i think about um, fretting like this is when if and when something isn't working you have to stop there's no point plowing on and hoping that when you get to the end of this refret it'll all work because it won't you usually know, uh, you know you know it from the point where it's going wrong you know it's going wrong and you just need to stop and uh, cut your losses as they might say um, and that just means admitting to yourself that it's not working because the uh, the alternative is if you carry on hoping that somehow it will right itself um, the fact is it won't and you will only have more frets to pull up at the end, which you won't be enjoy. So, admit to yourself when it's not working. Okay, beautiful. That's the top five now done. Um, and the rest, they're all ready to... I say they're ready. I'm going to take a little time. I think this time it will be off camera. Um, but first what I'll do, as I always do, is I will find myself a, a bit of fret paper, fly paper. And I will take off all the frets in sequence, like so. Hang them up there for the time being. And off camera, while I have something to eat, I will now clean out the slots one more time. And I'll put these things back on charge, and then we'll come back to ya afterwards. All right, see you in a bit. Oh, I'll do a bit more spraying too. Here we are. Let us begin, and let us assess the first stage. And that's really all it comes down to, is let's get the first set of glue in there, and... Let's give it a little tap and, and see how it fits, how it sits. We should be able to get a feeling for it fairly quickly. Now, a good thing about wood glue is you can lay it on fairly thickly, but you've got to leave yourself room. So you place your fret in such a way that it's equidistant. So my 9.5 inch radius block here that I've made myself 
I made myself. And I've got a million bits of paper to clean up glue, plus a nice damp cloth for uh, mopping up any spill. So really, what I'm just out to see is what how the fit is just now. So the thing about the glue is it, it even wood glue in a warm environment like this currently is it sets quite quickly well goes off quite quickly so it, especially if it's thin and it's set over the um, yeah if it comes out over the fingerboard it will form a skin pretty quickly right so there's a there's a first fret fitted folks um, and the question I have to look at I say is that does that feel okay to me? Is that seated? Um, and really, I have no very good way of telling. I might do one or two. Now, if it isn't, if they aren't seating the way I would like them to seat, then we may have to make a radical change or an executive decision. There's a little bit of movement, as in I can press them down a little tiny bit more. But it's hard to know. The other thing, what, what the other thing, what I can do is if I get my uh, two different types of things, bitey things, um, I can do a little twist here on the end of these. Oh yeah twist on the end of each fret, one in the middle, see if that gives it a little bit of extra bite, grip. So if it is at all loose, we can we can sort of artificially give it a, a little extra. And that's something I've done before. Um, you can buy special tools to do it. Um, and I'm sure that's a wonderful thing to have in your arsenal, armory of arsenals, but I didn't have it, so I had to sort of improvise. So again, with this one, we line up the line up the thing as close as, <laughs> come on, don't tell me it's not going to line up now because of the little twists I put on it. Line it up, and if it doesn't want to go, give it a little tap, and we'll Replace this, help it along, get rid of the excess. So this, um, I end up with just chucking the paper on the floor down here while I clean up. Because I can always pick that up later. It's my rationale. Do the ends down the middle. And again, you know, you can t tap it again and see. That's actually fine. Let's have a look down here. Stare at them both. Yeah, looking good so far. So now that was a. I'll do. I'll do sort of three or four because we've got three or fours worth of. Um, redos if we if we don't do all right with this one now I'm going to try I'm going to grab this with the other end of the uh, the other tool the uh, fret nipping no the fret lifting tool and see if I can use that to put a little twist on it actually you don't think it's no think it's anywhere near as good as the side cutters because the side cutters just do a little bit of cutting and <laughs> twisting at the same time How much they do is kind of anyone's guess, but it just adds a bit of a, a grip that I don't think it had before. And that doesn't hurt. Even being stainless, it's still actually not that hard to bend a little, twist a little tang into it. In fact, was it, um, I can't 
can't remember, what, was it the CMI that I took all the frets off that the other day? And in fact, all of them, it turns out, were fitted that way by manual tang, twist, <laughs> tang twister, which is quite incredible. Um, so they'd obviously started with some totally, uh, sorry, they had, it had a tang, but it had no, none of the little barbs on it. So the, the th whole thing was sort of, had just been crimped by hand at every point, and it was random, ir irregular points. So it wasn't a machine that did it. It was somebody had done pretty much exactly what I've just done there. Sat and uh, yeah, twisted it, make it stay. So let's do a fourth one, and we'll compare. So having felt that these just did feel a tiny little bit loose, um, as you saw, I'm kind of going along and adding just a little bit of a twist in them um, which is making it a little harder to get them in in, in a sense but it's holding them in a bit better as well and it's just a all well it is a little barb I'm adding to it that wasn't there before or a little extra barb extra barb and for me it's it's feeling better than not so it might be a smart move to pull the first one and do the same in the first one while we're here and that's doable so I'm going to do that with my bare hands as you can see I'm going to put a little bend on it one in the middle how much you do is a guesstimate really um, and only, only guessing will do, but there we are. Um, add a bit more glue into the mix. Now I've just um, I've just been and checked the spraying in the other room, and it's well, it's not bad. It's um, it seems a little wetter still than I'd expected, although I did kind of lay it on quite thick on the last coat, so um, I should be patient. Now I'm pushing that in sideways now, that's pretty crap isn't it? Come on now, get in and stay in. Bring that along. Get it in there. The hammer can be very handy to just get that um, tapping sort of started, really. Um, And then you don't have to worry once it's just caught, as it were. Yeah, so I might have to, I'll go and check in a minute and see whether I'm going to get any more coats onto that, on these necks at all today. I need to, really. I need to. Really do. It's okay. It's okay. That's okay. So we've got um, the spongy stuff on the neck rest. Kind of takes a bit of the pressure out of it. Bounces it a little bit. Okay, that's feeling looking good to me. But we still we move along the thing. What's it? The uh, support. As we go and a little twist. I'm doing three probably on each one. So it's very entirely unscientific, but it's a it's a nifty little additional grip. I think when you just know or you just have a feeling that it's a bit 
could be potentially just a little bit too loose um, or it's in a circumstance that you'd ideally like to use super glue but there are other circumstances meaning that's inappropriate then I, I think this wood glue with an extra twist in the tang isn't a bad um, uh, compromise really that's better than going for the super glue squelch and let's get the next one going so I just also was in the uh, the other room, the storeroom or the woodworking room as it currently is and I just did a quick test with something I've never done before which is using the router and a router bit to uh, round over the edges of a strap. Well it's not a strap, I just used a test piece but um, I'm about to cut out the shape of JT's uh, upcoming <laughs> replacement body guitar which started out well, as I think I mentioned, it's like Trigger's Broom. It's a guitar that I made for him. Um, the neck twisted, so we went to replace that and then realized that he wanted, preferred this quirky 80s neck um, that I just recently salvaged. And so we thought we could just swap that on. I Sorry, I thought we could just swap that on without actually realizing that the scale was completely different. I don't quite know how I overlooked that, but I did. Anyway, we sort of went piling onwards with our plan to uh, fit this wonderful vintage neck until I came to a grinding halt where I realized, it, in fact, it was absolutely the wrong scale and would not work at all. So we sort of had a choice. Did we put a, a nondescript neck on this body? Um, and actually, I wasn't massively happy with the kind of body anyway even though it, it worked on the other you know in its first incarnation but it wasn't I was not happy with it particularly so we kind of got obsessed with this neck and then I decided well screw this instead of trying lots of different things why don't I make the guitar around this neck and we'll start with a poplar body which is relatively inexpensive or a blank I'll make a body and then we'll go from there and and mark it out and cut it for this unusual neck that looks, well it came off a sort of super strap but has a 24 fret um, Gibson scale length so <laughs> explains why it didn't work the first time. Anyhow, so that's going to be, that's coming up so the next stage on that is to cut out the shape and once I've cut the shape out um, I shall want to be cutting the um, cutting the edges because I normally would do them by hand, but I'm going to do them with the router this time since I've got a bit, and it makes only makes sense to learn how that works. And I've just done a test piece, and actually it feels pretty good, um, or it looks pretty good, uh, because one thing I know that JT really likes in in his guitar bodies is that sort of vintage full rounded body spec as well as the 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 rounded over forearm slope you know that isn't doesn't sort of turn a mechanical right angle corner like some of the modern guitars um, I think particularly some ply plywood guitars look like that anyway so I'm um, going to do that shortly in between doing this and uh, what else? Spraying, getting as far as I can. Um, it's now gone four o'clock, so today's ideal sweet spot for spraying may have passed already, but we shall see. Um, I'll do my best. It's quite one of those days where I could literally stay here till midnight and still have a ton of other jobs to do. So I've got this one to do, which is a sort of 
a rush job in inverted commas because of Alex's short time down here in this part of the world. But I've got Trekkie 9 to start reassembling now. It's finished and ready for putting together and setting up. Trekkie 6 needs to get sprayed. Fingers crossed the conditions will be right for nitro spraying tomorrow. That's what I'm hoping. Although it seemed to retain the humidity in here a bit more than I was happy with today. So we may not have the ideal com conditions. But actually, I mean, it's not going to get any better. So if it isn't tomorrow, it isn't going to be any day, I don't think. So that's the plan. Um, and, you know, once I've got these spray things done, then quite a bit more is freed up. Freed up. Now, let's have a quick look down here. That's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Everything's looking neat. Um, again, always worth stopping and taking that sight down the uh, neck and just be sure you you get pretty you get able to see pretty quickly when something's sticking up and going to cause problems and if it's not going right you'll see several things sticking up and it will it'll be a, a bit of a flag saying there's something not working here stop and reconsider or even pull the whole lot out and do it again which I've had to do in the past it's usually only only because I didn't stop beforehand. As I said, the more the more you refuse to look and be realistic, the further down the track you get, and the bigger the U-turn is you've got to do in the end, which is a not very pleasant. So, as you can see, a nice slow process. Um, bam. <laughs> So I might, uh, shall I, should I stay on? Well, could do. Quick, quick wipe down each time. Got all the equipment standing by, kitchen roll. Ow. Hurty wrists. If we go much, if we go up to 70 or beyond 70 in relative humidity, then I think I will have to call time on the spraying today. So I'll go and have a look in another 20 minutes or so. I suspect I might just get one more coat in. Um, as far as I know, well, I know that the GS2 neck was pretty thin. In terms of finish so I don't want to make it too much different from the original if I can help it. It has got a bit of colour in it so I needed to get some whoop, get on get some tinted poly on there first and then go over with some matte. Um, so it's a bit tricky because you make up tinted poly and you have to decide how tinted it is and do you go with a full kind of dark looking thing which might look good on this one guitar but might really not suit the build up of finish on the other guitar I'm doing so I have to try and get a sort of midpoint and it might mean that I end up with a couple more coats on the SG2 sorry GS2 uh, than I perhaps would have liked So you see what I'm doing here is d doing exactly what the um, the tool you can buy would do, um, only for a rather a lot less money. Or it's doubling up tools, I should say. So um, you know, and the, the the Tang widener, if you like, is is just literally going to do the exact same thing. It's going to bend out a piece of the material to sort of grip the wood a bit more, that's all. Can't add any material to it, so it's only twisting a bit out sideways. Which is just exactly what I just did. Curse splat. Well, going well, 
in the refretting department. Quite pleased with it. And we've preserved the, um, the end fills as well. So with a bit of luck, if we can just get this flush or the bevel done without damaging the uh, fingerboard too much, or the edge, I should say, then we will be laughing. So realistically, um, will I leave this till tomorrow? Possibly. The end beveling, to be fair, is not um, is not a long process, really. So it would only be a short kind of uh, um, diff different postponement of the setup process. I mean. It's, it's like putting 10 minutes at the end of today or 10 minutes tomorrow before I get on to the, doing the setup. Just as easy to do it tomorrow. If it feels like the glue needs that time to dry before I, I, I prefer to let the glue dry that extra bit before I run the, the uh, beveling block down the edge. So the refretting process is slow and sure, steady, but it's not it's not overly complex or just uh, getting it prepared and then being observant, just being realistic about what you see and if something's not going right, calling calling it out and stopping and reevaluating. You know, and just really being being able to assess what's going wrong if it starts to go wrong. Because, like I said, I think the worst thing you can possibly do is just end up with uh, end up with a whole rack of frets that you would sort of in your gut know it isn't right, and yet you've continued onwards and you you're hoping and it's just never going to be right. So, and it's just a it's a hiding to nothing, quite literally. So you don't want to be there. Um, so it's about evaluating early. So it's about sensing whether the fit feels good. I could tell from early on that this felt a little tiny bit loose. Um, so I immediately switched the strategy to um, putting that little twist in the, in the tang to get those little, to act as those little bumps, if you like. Um, so that kind of left me a bit more, feeling a bit more confident about the, the fit um, and the grip. Uh, but after that, you know, being being sure to sight down the neck and be ruthless about whether it's working. You know, is it is it level? Knowing, being able to spot whether there's any little bit sticking up or not. Um, and also, you know, like with the first fret. You know, I didn't put a little twist in that tang there, and you know, even though it sort of looks like it's in and everything's great, if you're going to do a little twist in the tang for all of them, then pull that one out again and do it again. And if if it feels like it came out crooked or or stretched it out of shape or anything, then chuck it away and cut another one. Um, go through the end, tr you know, the short trimming trimming process, etc., etc. Just don't take any risks of messing it up. That's really what it's all about. So you can see a bit of chit chat on a Thursday afternoon. Whoops, that's fallen sideways. A bit of chat, and we're almost uh, done on the refret. Well, not quite, because there's always more frets at the small end up here, but we're doing pretty well. And there's a nice day outside too. It was difficult this one because the hammock was a calling, but I just thought, no, I've got to take advantage of the humid, the lack of humidity today. I'm hoping, 
that'll pay off. But uh, whether it will or not, I've got some. I've at least got some of the finish sprayed, so uh, it may not be all of it, and I may have to repeat. But we're not far off. <laughs> Sorry, camera. I haven't even thought about the camera view. You're miles away down here, probably somewhere. Have I got my? I was going to say I've got the mirror. No. <laughs> Twist. Twist, nip and twist, nip on. Oh, now they see that wasn't so clever. Ooh, now that wasn't so brilliant. That wasn't so brilliant. Just have a feel of this. That's possibly I gripped that a little bit too hard for my own liking. That one. Uh, let's have a, a feel. Let's see if I can just straighten this bit a tiny fraction away from where it was. These are supposed to be stainless steel. Has somebody ripped me off and given me the wrong, wrong material? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look. How are we doing? Yes, that's interesting. Be a, a little bit lighter on my, my thingy bite. I was just beginning to put too much force into it there, taking too big a piece, I think. And then, yeah, you can sort of overdo it and end up with too big a bend which ain't no good to nobody So, um, who's after me on the phone? So, <coughs> we're heading towards <coughs> the near the top end. We're not quite there yet. And I'll have to uh, soon put this down on its base and put a little bit of foam under the neck heel. I think that's probably about as much as I can do just to support it a little bit. I'm just going to back to these and try and make the twist a little bit lighter because I've kind of bit too much there. I so think it's about twisting it around in your hand so you don't actually bend the fret. That was the main thing to, to do. So it's a kind of a spin rather than a, I sort of know what I mean. Yes. Yes, I, I looked at the hammock today and it was calling to me. I had an hour, but then I thought, no, go and use use the uh, hum the dry air. Go on, get moving. Get some of these here shows on the roads. It's uh, it, it's kind of typical that to get stalled or held up in a roadblock due to weather um, getting in the way of finishing because it's very sensitive to the temperature and humidity. So this is the perfect time, well as good as it's going to get for a while anyway. It might get a little bit drier over the next few days. It's forecast to be sunny all week so let's have a look down here. Yeah, looking pretty good. Right, we're sort of soon we're going to be running out of support on the neck support, but that's fine. We will switch over to placing it on its body. I 
I think when we get down to these final ones that are beveled to exactly the right size, it's just going to be a matter of being very careful to make sure that they're visually fitted tidily. Otherwise, <coughs> you don't want to get them just slightly off. It looks a bit ragged. the microphone. Okay, that's good. One, two, three, four, five, we said, didn't we, that were ready beveled. Yeah. So, <laughs> talk about making a mess. I mean, that's a good thing about wood glue. You can afford to make an absolute mess. This background noise, by the way, is the sight being used in its normal way, but you don't normally hear it because I'm normally here in the evening more, more often than not. And it's much quieter. So once I've done this I will stop the recording, hang up the guitar to set or for the glue to set and then I'm going to go off and do some routing of strap bodies and routing the curved edges on them which should be good. I have to kind of think whether I can get it all the way around the edge shape um, I haven't really thought that through yet. I can do it on a straight line piece that I just tested it on, but um, see, I've done it slightly wrong there. Got a, a little bit of a twist. Um, yeah, I can do it on a test block, but I haven't quite figured out how you take that same router bit round corners or a, on a curved bit. And it's quite—it's a quarter-inch router bit, but it's quite powerful. Um, so it, it's sort of a bit mm, terrifying, <laughs> could be the word. I will take care and do it very carefully. One, two, three, four, five. So the next five after this one, the final five, should be according to legend should be um, nice and ready beveled mm -hmm. this one's putting up a resistance nope. thank you Funny watching the end of the neck kind of bounce when I do that, and it, it has a spring to it, transmitted through this uh, foam on the end here. So it bounces and flips back up. But you can't do nothing else. Okay, so now let's bring this down onto the ground. We need a bit of foam, a bit of 
foam, 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 foam. <laughs> Good. So the final five, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up the glue all in advance on all five. Since I can. Right. So, the key thing here is to get these all in perfect position, ready beveled, right to the end. Ah, oh, forgot to. I've got to give them a little tang tweak. Come on. One, five. Exactly lined up, please. Target. Two. Go it. You could do it. Just about right. Number four or five. Come along. And the last one. It's gone all quiet. It must be five o'clock. Blimey. Is it quiet or is it quiet?
bit too much on the mark, I would say. Good. Okay, I think we are done in the land of fretting. And you can't see, but I'm just going to scoot down the board. Yeah, that's that one's longer than that one, slightly longer. That's down at the hand-done side of things, but I think we'll have to live with that. It, it might get in a tiny bit closer and just trim that one, but hey, that'll do for now. Okay, that's it on the fretting side. See you later. Right then. Whew. So, here we are. Ladies and gents. Fretted, refretted time to get an adjustable tusk nut going. Adjustable nuts, adjustable nut. And I think we need the lights on and we need to do a little bit of adjustment, adjustable adjustment work down at the nut end, maybe. Just to clean this glue and stuff off here. Ooh. Mm hmm. quite know what that sticky stuff on there is or isn't but needs to come off right the adjustable nut made in Canada made in one of those blister packs of impossible to get into plastic which means you probably end up chopping your hand off I'm going to use a very sharp knife to extricate it Ugh. so it's a noisy Friday here at the Shop of Works because we've got, um, what have we got going on out there? We've got the normal site malarkey going on out there. Um, so it's busy and it's hot here and I'm foiled and it's the hottest day of the year so far, which is, I don't mind, but it just means I'm a bit on the boiled side. So I'm just going to start by um, taking off the little tab on the side and then I'm going to flatten down the grub screws, the feet if you like, um, and I sort of give them a, a bit of a flat thing, 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 thing. So uh, day today's been started off very early in the morning. <laughs> well, for me it's very early, 6 a.m. And Claire took a call in bed, which is never a good sign. And it turns out my dad took a fall uh, out of his bed and went face forward and smacked his nose on the ground, planted his nose. So. He was face down with all his weight on top of him. Um, and the ambulance had declared that it was hours away, if anything. Um, so he was very distressed, extremely distressed. So my kind of main worry uh, when I got there was to try to... Um, Calm him down a bit. I think this is number two. Is this number two? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he needed, he needed, well, first of all, I had to figure out whether he was, in, you know, what he'd 
damaged or whether he was in danger of, I don't know, having a heart attack or something. He was very, very unable to breathe. <coughs> but he was also panicking and screaming quite a bit. So I managed to sort of stabilize him and calm him to begin with a little bit. And then I managed to roll him over uh, onto his side. And I just ended up kind of rolling him with my body wrapped around his kind of thing. Um, I ended up in a, a sort of, I suppose you could call it a reassuring clinch, which is probably what it was. Um, but I think that's actually more than anything, that's what he needed at that point in time was... Uh, to feel somebody holding on to him because he was extremely afraid um, so anyway so I kind of stayed in that position with him to try and calm him down and think through if there were any further options um, but he seemed to be he seemed to sort of stabilize being okay-ish like that um, and then about an hour <coughs> after I got there I think not much after, not much further than that hour, the uh, ambulance crew of three young women paramedics came from Oakhampton and uh, it was a very a great relief because my stepmom had been told that it could be three to five hours or more, <laughs> you know, expect any amount of delay basically. So the fact that they were relatively soon on the scene was a blessing really. And they got to him, and they did a sort of fair bit of no-nonsense. Right then, Stephen, they called him. His, his name's Stephen Ronald, but they called him Stephen. Right then, Stephen, you're getting up now. And that's a fact. And they just, yeah, hoiked him up, and away they went with him. Bless them. So they did a great, a great job. Okay, so um, we have the new nut there ready to go, which is great. And now... We have got, what have we got to do? Oh yes, fret leveling. So we really do want to fit a set of strings. I honestly can't be bothered to stretch out a load of, <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, a load of, now what am I looking for? Are they nines or tens? I can't be bothered to stretch out a load of coiled ends. So I'm gonna use a set of tens. Uh, no, 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 what, what did he say? He said nines, didn't he? Let's get my head around this. Let's use a set of Harley Benton nines. That's what they're there for. <coughs> now, every now and then, and today, I'm going to have to, I will, disappear into the other room and consider putting on a coat of satin nitro spray. So it's a, it's a spray day here today. Nut drops off. And a spray day. So I'm going to um, keep going backwards and forwards build up some layers not too many on JT's candy apple reds um, but I've got the Trekkie out there as well um, so just have to sort of see how it goes now this is the first time I've used the HVLP sprayer for um, nitro and it's, I have to say it's com it flows completely differently or it is flowing completely differently from the water-based stuff now what I don't really know is the, how to fully, totally, reliably clean the sprayer after the uh, nitro back ready for use with um, water-based stuff. So I'll have to find that out. I mean, it's going to be a matter of doing it with um, thinners, of course. And the spray I'm using at the moment is 50% lacquer and 50% thinners. Um, so that should be all should be straightforward but you know that I think I'd have to fire some thinners through it first and then get that kind of cleaned out that way um, but anyway it's a first a first go so we shall see um, what I'm also slightly nervous about is in the half hour between coats uh, sorry not half hour in the hour between coats um, um, I'm just slightly nervous if it gets blocked up or whatever because apart from wiping some thinners across the end. I don't really see a simple way of cleaning it out on the fly, as it were. Um, well, this is really annoying. <laughs> God. 
A slight bend in the string and you don't want to go through. Come on, friend. No, it's always the way. Come on. And that's got caught under here. Marvellous. I hate these Harley Benton strings, truthfully. They're all right for the sacrificial strings, but I wouldn't use them. They come out in this sort of coily, oily, coily sort of way, whatever that means. But they're so not quite straight, so that they don't want to pass through a tight block like this. <sighs> right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the first, the middle ones on first, um, as often spoken of, so that we hold down, or can hold down the nut first, so I'm not too worried about the sacrificial strings, it's about busting them and stuff, or how they go on. So that goes onto there, and that goes onto there, and I will sort of give that a pull back to there, wind on. Now possibly, in fact in the second, what I'll do is I'll probably um, paint the frets while well, I'm at it because we're going to do some fret leveling. I'm pretty certain we'll do some fret leveling. It would be a miracle if we didn't, so I'll prepare it as if we were. Um, and that will save me struggling to get the pen, marker pen, onto there afterwards. These are smaller frets than the previous ones, um, slightly narrower and um, probably about the same height very close to but they're, yeah they're a little narrower but I mean that that's gone I went off the measurements that Alex gave me um, because I didn't have the guitar in front of me and I didn't have the time to wait until I got the guitar in front of me so um, you know we, we just have to go with what we got <laughs> now what I'm doing at this point is I'm just going to pull the um, I'm just going to load up the strings a little bit and then I'm going to just make sure the nut is where I want it to be and I will go ahead and stick it on. Now I've, I've sort of tried using tight bond and I'm not sure it really pays off so I think what I'll probably end up doing when I got the sense of where the nut sits I will probably end up going with super glue so, so it's th this looks like it's pretty much central but I'm in fact it is I'll go with that um, the reason I was I like to if possible wait to the right to the end and then you can get the, if, it, if it's tight you can sort of balance the um, the overhang where it needs to be sometimes what you don't want is the if it's tight you don't want the base string particularly getting an extra bit of space compared to the um, treble which is where you'd prefer to have the room for movement but put that there, let's hold that there, get those out of the way and let's get that in there nicely. So if anything we want a little bit of extra space on the treble side if anything. tension on both. Now I think I've put a little bit extra room on the bass side. That's my feeling about this guitar. I think that's right. I may just have to file a tiny bit of that bass off. Bass. Nut bass. Nut bass city limits. Anyway. So we've got the frets marked up. We've got the nut in place. We've got the strings going on. And then from here, we'll get straight into the fret leveling and the whole setup routine, which will include obviously checking and setting the neck relief, um, adjusting the action again to make sure it's where we want it. I mean, the idea was to get it as low as it can go, uh, given the frets. So there's no reason why it shouldn't go a bit lower. <coughs> I think it was potentially only limited by the 
seating of the bridge. Sometimes on these guitars, if you can't take the bridge down any further, you don't really have a lot of option for lowering the action, even if the frets allow it, which when they've visited me, they tend to. Still, we shall, we shall see. I think we've got about a millimetre to play with, which should be enough. Certainly enough to make an impression or a difference. <coughs> yeah, so anyway, that means um, last night I got three hours sleep. So once I've done this spray run, I intend to go back for a break in the garden for the remainder of the afternoon uh, and get, get all muckhammocked. Okay. Right, so interestingly, this is uh, sticking up a little bit too close. Oh, certainly, I just need a bit of adjustment here. Um, uh, can we? In fact, I think it just needs the paper moving out of the way. It's close, <coughs> close, but the paper is going over the top of the surrounds and causing it to hit the strings. So that will do. Move that. Uh, so the next spray will be one, two, and then three, and then we'll be out the door. And now I need the clippers, cutters. Get rid of these leftover bits of string, just because I don't like them there. They offend me. Okay, yeah, positioning, good. Yep, yep, yep. Now we sort of expect to get everything, um, we expect everything to, to start with the um, strings at rest on the first fret, and that's how the adjustable nut works. And then we use this to dial it up into the air, which is how this works, <laughs> if you get what I mean. Ouch. So, we'll get this up to tension. <laughs> Go away, fly. Okay, so now we've got approximately to tension, and the next thing to do will be to adjust the action at the far end and just see where we can get it <coughs> and what we want. So at the moment, on the low E, it's currently coming in at nearly 2.5. So, let's say 2.5? Maybe, maybe. So we've got a bit of room. We can go right down to here, which comes in at just over 1.5. So I think we have to accept that we can only go to the <coughs> flat on the deck position. And I'll do that uh, pretty much at both sides just to get on with. And then we'll see how it looks. Often it's a different setup on the far side. Well, as it is, yeah, look, way too low. So what that is caused by, who knows? But that's what your saddles are for to balance this out and get it right. But you'd think that on a flat bridge, on a flat neck, it would just be a, f a flat deal, but it's not. So it's a sort of decked out on the base side, raised up on the treble side, and then a kind of balance between them. So 1.2-ish, 1 1.2-ish, a bit higher, a bit higher, too high. And not too far off. We can take it down a little bit again, but so I'm just sort of, excuse me, doing it by eye. Um, before we get stuck in, Okay, let's 
just give it a bit of a pull. Harley Benton strings don't like being stretched. They tend to break. So let's have a look. 1.5, just a bit over. That's okay. Um, under. So that's one fraction too shallow. We're about 1.2 at the at the most. 1.2, just about 1.1, one, one, so a little higher for the B. One two, that's about right. That's a little higher. Right, tune up. Sorry, oh, I've left you behind on the view. Sorry. Okay, now let's look at the relief. Wow, <coughs> that is a ton of relief. So, let us now go back and counter the relief by tightening up the truss rod, which if you remember, already started out pretty tightly done up. Look at that, as soon as you do that, look at how the neck bends. Wow, that's, that's instantaneous. Okay, so, what we care about is the shape of the neck first and foremost, and that, that is probably too much. So you kind of say, well, how much do I need? And you need just a little bit, and you'll, you'll notice it when the, the, you can press down on the first and last fret simultaneously and see a gap. Now that's very sensitive, that's almost too much, and I've only just cranked it a little bit. So this truss rod is highly sensitive at a certain point. It doesn't do anything around the, um, the middle department. And now we're a little bit lower of the first fret here, so it can raise that up a bit, get that distance back, and a little bit on the first fret here. Okay. Now, I'm going to level now. Um, I've got everything where I want it. I'm going to level. And you might say, but you, you haven't checked the notes. You haven't bent the strings to see if there's a, an issue. Why are you instantly going to level it? And I'm going to level it because not only does the leveling help with just the tiniest adjustments anyway, so it's not a bad thing to do. You know, Even if I think it plays pretty well, I can do a very small adjustment where I can do fine tuning with the fret leveling beam. But the other reason is because actually it tells me what's going on with the neck as much as anything else. So if I were to slack that off, um, if I calibrate the beam to begin with, that's just about, just about right. And I then drop this off the side, spread the string with the block down here. And then what I'm looking to do is just very lightly go over the frets with the sanding beam or the adjustable banana, whatever I like to call it. And in, in going over the frets here, it'll tell me how, oops, go over the strings there, it'll tell me how um, uneven or even anything is. So just having a quick look at it, um, that's not bad. It's cutting here, here, a little bit low here, 
and a little bit low at the end there. So that's fairly representative of it being not too far off. Um, so what I can now do is just add a little pressure in the middle to kind of bend the rod just a tiny fraction and I'm going to sort of, as I call it, focus on the end a little bit <coughs> just to make sure these final frets are leveled out as well. And that's pretty, there's two low ones there really and that's about it in the whole trail of things. So what I kind of like to do then is to replace the string while it's still hasn't unwound, thank you Hurley Benton, and then have a two octaves. Um, right, that feels, feels and sounds good. So I'm going to take the same calibration and do the B track. I think what it's telling me straight away from that first run is that it's a very good fretting, um, which, which I'm pleased about, although not bragging about, because it is, it's quite unusual to get it that good first time, but I'm, I'm happy that I have. So I sort of have a sense now of how much to run the, the uh, file. Um, and, and what we're testing for at this point is the individual notes um, playing as plucked notes. This is a bit of flimsy uh, pick pick. But what we're listening for the bends. We want the bends to play without choking. Now it just started to zizz as it got across to the G which is quite common in this in this process because what it what we expect um, is if there is even the slightest bit of unevenness we expect a high a low action high E string to potentially choke out when it crosses or goes up the hill of the fret and crosses over into what I call the G track. So we expect that's where the fret will, or the, the note will zizz um, if there's a tiny bit of unevenness that needs levelling out. And it's a very, very small amount, which is an amazing thing, but it, it's enough to benefit from this sort of levelling. So as I level out the, the top section of the G track, still noticing a little bit low here, but it's nothing, it's not causing any playing problems. So now what I'm expecting is the bent, the bent high E note up there should cross over. Cross over pretty well, but let's just have a look. Now it's choking out just there, and that's, that's actually more on the D track than the G. So I'll take that as good, and I'll do the, G, the D track. So with, a, with the nines, you tend to be able to bend right across up to the top of the hill as I call it, that's the high point of the fret radius and then you tend to be able to bend beyond it a little bit which is effectively, if you're, if you're thinking about bending a high E, it's actually going down the other side of the hill. Um, so, so even if you've cleared the G track and it's playing okay, what you'll find is that the, uh, you'll lose space by just by virtue of geometry as you come down, start to descend the other side of the fret radius. Um, you know that the, the frets just simply can't. Uh, this, this, it's just a limit of geography, ge geometry, based on a low action and a big bend. Um, one of the things that also affects it is if you also have a tight radius. That, and that's bent over, right over onto the D there. So a little bit more on the D, and I'm going to recalibrate just to make sure. So it's it's just a little bit uneven right at the top of the D track. D 
he drank. Mm. So I'm going to focus my attention just on this top bit here. Now, with a set neck, this is often a, a, an area of a slight problem anyway because of the, the way that the, the truss rod doesn't act very well on the thickened up, glued in part of the neck. So it's quite difficult to get it to follow the uh, truss rod bend. is between the G and the D and that's on what action on the high E. Oh, well that's a millimetre, that's probably why. It's too low. We need about 1.2 or else we're just being silly. Yeah, we're kind of, if we don't have around about 1.2 then we're sort of punishing the frets just for the hell of it because we, we would be on a, a, a diminishing returns sort of situation so there's nothing big or clever about fighting an ultra low action with the fret leveling beam you want to be just a bit more accurate with the height 1.2 ish well, everything's low that's because i changed the radius uh, sorry the relief curve a little bit okay that's a bit better oh well got it got it quite reasonably good despite the fact it's ultra low ultra low god that's one millimeter on the low e silly silly There you go. That's more like it. So we were, I was, we, I was pushing it a bit too low there. So that serves me right, but it doesn't hurt because it's leveled out nicely anyway. Um, but yeah, it's just a little bit too, uh, too much. Expecting a little bit too much. Um, right, we're sort of heading towards the. God, shut up, shut up, shut up. We're heading towards the next coat of spray now I have to go and stop the videos and go and examine you know, the coat or the finish so far and see what I've got but it's um, the humidity is falling even further at the moment so that's all good don't know what they're bashing out there but bit of a frizzle right down there so let's pay that a little bit of attention down at the fifth fret I think that's a low fret coming into play here the fourth fret is a little bit low just maybe pressed in or tapped in a tiny bit higher than everything else okay and then we switch over to the E track and we'll be ready curve in it. Nice. Okay.
So with the stainless steel, the sandpaper does a pretty good job still, um, works well. That's good hitting the paper. Can't really um, hear what's going on if that paper gets in the way. Yeah, a little bit, um, a little bit of fizz. Oh my god, that is low there. A little bit of fizz down there, but that's because it's at just over one millimeter. Let me out! That should be right. So I think I'm just going to focus on the A track again. There's a little bit of fuzz fizzle down there. I can just eke that out. What's that out there? No one I know. Dom, 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 yes. Right, so concentrate on the D. There's a little bit of frazzle down there. I don't know if it's a funny wiggle in the neck or something, but it's it's uh, interfering with play down here. So I'm just going to sort of hope concentrate on this little spot and hope we can uh, bottom out, I suppose you'd call it, bottom out the, uh, the low fret here down at four, actually. And so what happens when you get a low fret, if you've for some reason hit, tapped it in harder or it's sitting in a different, slightly different position to everything else, that low fret is what causes the next fret to appear high and uh, it dictates really what you can do. better. Okay, I'm happy with that. Um, yeah, so a low a low fret is almost always the, uh, the thing that dictates what you can and can't do. And if you have a low fret, it means you have to reduce or take the other frets down to bottom out around the low fret, which some people would think is a horrendously costly uh, undertaking, but it's just the way it has to be. I'm afraid. Okay. So um, when you're re-stringing with this adjustable nut, take the strings off from the outside in. Oh, what I think I'll do... Oh, that is getting noisy. I'll have to stop in a minute. I'm going to get the Dremel with a drum. Not like that one out there. Dremel with a drum. I'm just going to sand back that now I lost a little piece of metal. I bet the Hoover eventually, ultimately had it. It's a shame there was a, a little C-shaped spannery bit of metal that did this thing. Now I have to resort to using a Dremel, um, uh, an adjustable spanner for it. But still, it works. It's just, it's just that when you, you know something's gone and it really, really annoys you because you can't find it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to nothing. I'm just going to hold this and just gently wear down this little bit of excess on this side here. Difficult to get it to um, completely flat, uh, but we'll get close. <sighs> what, I, what I never really want to do is get it so that we, um, now I've got it, it's gone dirty with my filthy hands. We do, what we don't want is a, um, we don't want to scratch the finish around it. So we always hold off, but then what you can do is, for the final bit, you can, when we've got the strings off, we can mask this off a little bit. And we can just tidy it up then. So those are the Harley Benton's done their job. 
this is a not normally I'm not as I said I think before it's, it's a little bit edgy nerve-wracking you to be doing a um, a refret in a short time and you know two days oh overnight if you like isn't like massively short time I mean as you can see it's come you know getting there comfortably within the, the time frame but uh, the, the nervousness only comes from there there aren't any there's no gap there's no leeway for God, I hate these strings get in the bin there's no leeway for or margin for error really that's the that's the only thing um, when somebody you know somebody's passing by you know what because not on this case but once in a very long while you might get something that just will not do it and then you uh, you might have to pull all the frets it's happened once or twice before and I'm just not happy with the way it's gone and I pull all the frets clean up the board and start again and if you uh, somebody's sort of on the way in from somewhere to collect and you're racing to try and get that done it's a it's a horrible feeling and it, we don't really want to be in that sort of situation okay so what I'm going to do now on camera is I'll just show you the I'll do the edge sanding just separately off camera but while we're here I will just show you the um, recrowning so I need the pen so now the uh, I've done the leveling now I'm going to recrown it. This is quite fine fret wire, so I'm going to use the medium side of my Stumac uh, thingy crowning tool. And this just helps me round off any flat edge or flat surface on the fret from the leveling process, which is pretty good to do. Um, and so this concave file uh, kind of rolls down the fret and so it cuts in at the sharp edges basically and heads inwards and the aim is to leave a thin line of um, marker pen down the centre of the fret. When we, when we do that and just leave that untouched, this bit of thin black marker, it, it tells me that I've reshaped the crown of the fret a little bit um, and it's, <laughs> it's probably easier to do this. Um, it tells me that I've re reshaped it as much as possible, but without changing the height. And the fact that I'm moving very quickly across these tells me another thing, and that is that very, very little actual fret metal was removed in the levelling process. The one or two frets where I stay a little bit longer, perhaps like that one, um, and that tells you. And this one too, I think, this, that tells you where um, uh, more materials had to be removed. It's a little bit extra work involved there. Um, but most of the t most of these frets are just sort of pretty much whizzing by, and that really is an indicator. It's a good indicator of, of how the how the initial fretting was. Uh, you know, were they all more or less level, or were there one or two high ones? I think there's probably one high one there, really. Um, which again, in a in a, each refret is not a bad outcome. Uh, so, it's all looking good down this end. Hardly anything to uh, recrown. A little bit on that one, but no, almost none. A little bit in the centre of that one. There you go. So very, very straightforward. So that, as a sort of diagnostic thing, that tells me virtually nothing was um, virtually nothing was removed in the levelling, tiniest bits. I mean, I just I think that's nice to know because sometimes when you're beginning using this method, you can be very concerned that you've you've taken more and sometimes you can take lots off if you're not careful but more than more often than not we tend to overestimate what we've taken off and as a result we can get very nervous and easily freaked out um, and actually when you when you kind of look at it you realize that um, 
hardly taken any material off at all. So what I'm doing here is I'm just I'm bending this thing a little bit so I can get quite close onto the, uh, the, the nut base material and just skim it as flush as I can without cutting into the finish. And that, that I think is about it. And then if it's, if it's squared off the nut a little bit, we can just put a, a little bit of a curl curve back on the nut edge just to smooth it off. Okay, so there we have it. That feels good. I mean, it's still, it still sits fractionally proud, um, but the, the problem you've got is the only way to change that is to continue um, sanding it, in which case you're going to sand the finish down. Um, I mean, you can't really scrape it either. That's the other thing. I'll try a little bit more. And the bend on the sanding thing is quite good because you can you can minimise the amount that it's touching the surrounding finish. If it's got a bend on it, at least you know it's lifting away from the finish in a safe <laughs> aspect. That's about it. I'm not going to get any closer than that. Okay, so that's uh, that bit done. And then the next stage, which I'll kind of do all off camera, most, mostly off camera, is just to get the whole of this neck. Um, we can remove the nut for a minute. We can remove the nut by dialing in the screws and then moving it out of the way. And we can reset it how we want it. So what I'm doing is to begin with, we'll just mask off the whole of the fingerboard so that you can get the sandpaper and the thingy, what they called micro mesh. Oh, you know what? I bought a set of micro mesh thinking, okay, that's still expensive, but fair enough. It's, it's about the best deal and they're only a little thin strips but I'll cut them in two and get you know make them economize um, I got them and you know what this thing the set didn't even have the first three grips so it started from 3200 it didn't have 15 18 24 that really uh, cheeses me off because the standard set of micro mesh that you get used to buying uh, it contains all of those and to see a set you know, I might. You know, you could say, "Yeah, it's my fault. I didn't examine or, or cross-examine the, con the contents." I stupidly assumed it was the standard set that everybody sells, and I went ahead and bought it. And lo and behold, it's not got the, f the full set, which annoyed me. Anyway, let us stop this for now. I'm going to do some spraying. See you in a minute. Okay, <sighs> ladies and gentlemen, all polished out. Time to restring or string. String up, string, string. What do we got? Tens in there, nines in here. Yes. Ooh. And I got a bit more spraying to do, and, and then, then, then that's all good. So I don't know what the view is like at the moment, probably rubbish. I will sort you out in a minute when we come to string up the strings. Anyway, so this will be good to have this finished so I can uh, let Alex know it's available whenever he is available. Come on, out you come. So what time is it now? Ten past two. So I should get the last spray done in about ten minutes time once I've finished this. And then it can dry for half an hour and then I'll hang them all up in the storeroom and that'll be that. Now with the satin nitro, I'm not sure whether, ideally I would like to, to I'd like it to not have to, I'd like to not have to 
um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'd like to not have to sand it or anything. So the question is whether whether it will look okay on its own. I think at the moment I think there's some dust caught in the last layer. So either which way, I would need to sand that out and then kind of go from there. See if we can get one final. I'll do that in a minute. I'll I'll do a little bit of sanding. See if I can get get one the final coat that does the business. So there's the D string on. There's the G. Um, I didn't look and see what you could see. I wasn't being very careful, was I? He says, oh yes. Okay, whoops, too far. So, to avoid uh, the stinging sharp ends of frets, this is what I do. I'll show you on the next one. So, I take the string, pull it through. Put it through the post, pull it tight, make sure it's seated in the block, and then pull it back one fret worth, frets worth, and then as it comes round, I direct the held string or the loose string under the held string as it comes round, and then as it comes round the next time, I pull up the loose string and push the held string under the loose string the second time round, and that creates a sort of locking deal. So through, pull back one fret, hold it down. Let the um, held string go over the loose string the first time round, and as the loose string comes round, pull it up, and then direct the held string under the loose string the second time. There we go. Now I've got to find a spare screw. There's one missing on those on the truss rod cover. Universe of music, says Stag. Okay, so there's the strings all on. And then snip at the point where the string exits the little locking pinch thing which is pretty neat. So there's no risk of catching your fingers on these leftover bits later on, which is what I like most about it as a person who's forever catching their fingers. So I'm just going to pull this to seat it on, make sure everything sits on, and then I'll go for the first tune up just to get the strings to tension. Before I tighten that up, uh, where are is our there they are. Where are the these bits for dialing in some height? Okay.
Okay, I'm just going to now check the height of this and probably reduce that a tiny bit. So next stage, most importantly, is stretching stage, um, which I always recommend that people do until the guitar doesn't detune anymore. That's the important bit. Hmm, very light. That's what I like. So get the strings, give them some good solid stretching, and then we'll go into um, intonation once I've got most, if not all, of the stretch out. Followed by some big bends. Okay, I'm going to now plug in the 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 the, the tuner, and we'll just check the intonation and tweak it if required. Four forty one, that cracks me up. How did that set itself onto four forty one? Too sharp. Right, so that one is good. That one is good. That one is good. That one is back a bit. And this one is more back a bit. Uh. This one more again, uh, quite a bit more uh, run out of adjustment room there.
Okay. Back out with this one. Push forwards. Too long. Forwards of the G. Is that hitting the plastic? Alright, let's just take this out one minute. Let's do a quick check on the action once and for all. It may have moved a bit. Okay, one, barely 1.5, if that. One point five. One point two. One point four ish, yep. A little bit lower, tiny tweaks. Right, I think that's about it. You can't hear a damn thing when that's all going on out there. God, I'm <laughs> uh, 
I think that's the end of my ability to um, concentrate on hearing small noises, frankly. Um, Sounds like the um, a soundtrack from the Titanic. Okay, got to go and do some spring. Thank you. That's it. Got to go. Bye.